right, Mike, thanks for joining. It's great yeah. to great to see you again. Yep, yep. Yeah. Mike, why don't you give a little bit of your background um, and what you were doing before Bainbridge and, and consulting? Sure. So uh, immediately preceding the consulting gigs, uh, I was chief credit officer at Lighter Capital uh, here in Seattle, which where I'm located. Uh, and, and Lighter Capital is a pioneer in the revenue-based financing, mainly dealing with SaaS companies, but a few e-commerce uh, companies as well. Uh, so I was chief credit officer there. And prior to that, I uh, was chief credit officer at Bridge Bank down in San Jose, California. Uh, Bridge Bank is now a division of Western Alliance out of Phoenix. Uh, but Bridge, uh, for those who are familiar, does have a pretty decent uh, tech focus uh, being in the Silicon Valley. Uh, so I spent, you know, the majority of my career, um, all of my career in banking and the majority of that focused on tech lending. Nice. Well, this, we have a really big document here, something that's super important, I think, for a lot of founders, right, is how do you get better credit? How do you get capital? How do you get better credit? And um, what I'm excited about is to go through this deck. You did a great job of outlining it. And just sort of step through the, the various sections, we can dive in in more detail as we go. Sure. But why don't we just like, you know, kick it off. So with the goals, what 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 are you hoping, you know, founder would get out of, out of this? Yeah, video? yeah. And, and just as a reminder, there's, you know, a three uh, part blog that's, that's up on the Bainbridge site. So this outline here basically just follows uh, that, that document. But Obviously, a lot more detail in that doc, so um, people should check it out um, after this or before this, depending on their timing. But yeah, the goals uh, for today are, are really just, you know, walking you through the underwriting process and big picture, you know, starting with how do you pick the right product, the product that is going to fit what you need uh, from a cash standpoint and and the type of product that you're, you're most likely to qualify for. And then, you know, in each of those loan product underwriting processes, it can be pretty opaque. So just give a little bit of insight as to what uh, people can expect as they walk through and in particular, what core info they're going to need to compile to get through the underwriting process. Uh, and then we'll walk through some, you know, some, some pitfalls um, associated with the process. And then lastly, uh, just through my experience, uh, this is a little bit, um, self-serving, but, you know, the things, just some tips uh, uh, in my career, you know, the types of borrowers and prospects that have, have done well, uh, just share some of those tips, both in the underwriting process and then even post-funding fund on the, the uh, portfolio, nice. your reporting side. Yeah, that'll be super helpful. All right, well, let's, uh, let's jump in. So what's, how does an entrepreneur under, better understand the right loan product? Right, right. So, you know, the first thing is understanding what you're trying to do with the money. Um, and, you know, I sh again, should mention Bainbridge has the, the field guide up on the website that that explains, you know, the process of, you know, what to do when you're going out to seek capital and how to make sense of all the different loan products. But your first step is just understanding what's, you know, what's your, your cash need um, and what's the timing of that need. Uh, when do you need the money? Is it is it something that you need in a big lump sum, or is it something that's going to be spread out over months? And then, as importantly, um, what is that money going towards? And and you know how is the cash flow that's being generated from that uh, use of funds uh, expected to roll back in? So that's really important, and we'll get into it uh, on the next slide. But step two is then you know aligning that expectation, that, that cash need and the expectation of, of the cash flow uh, with the different loan structures to, to hopefully match up with the right product. Yeah, let's get into the nitty gritty. So we we've, we figured out what, what it is that we need the cash for. We, we have a sense of when those cash needs come about. Now what? Yeah, so this slide, it, it's it's just an example slide. So there are a ton of different loan products and, and the focus of the blog post was on what we call highly underwritten loan products. So th those are the products we've spelled out here. But if you refer to the field guide, it, it gives you the full breadth of, of possible loan products. Um, but if you look on this slide, it's you'll see some, some you'll start to see some patterns here. Um, on the bank side, 
you've got bank term loans and bank revolvers, and then kind of on the non-bank side are the rest that are laid out here. Um, and if you go back to, you know, what, what am I using the funds for? Um, there's really kind of two main categories, either working capital or growth capital. Working capital, simple example that most D2C e-commerce founders are, are, are familiar with is paying for inventory upfront. Um, so that's, uh, you know, back to the kind of the step one, okay, I need it to go buy a bunch of inventory and it's going to take me about three months on average to, to, uh, uh, sell through that inventory and receive the cash back. So that's your cash need and that's your incremental cash flow. So if you were looking on this page, you'd say, okay, well, that's going to put me probably, uh, in the need of either a bank revolver or an ABL loan. Mm -hmm. And the difference there is that, you know, banks are really conservative. So what we added on this slide was sort of a, a caveat, which is, okay, it's not just what you need uh, and what fits you the best, but also where you are in your life cycle, uh, right. because that's going to create a different risk profile and it's going to open you up to, you know, different types of lenders. So banks are obviously the most conservative. They're looking for companies that are well-established, profitable, liquid, stable kind of working capital ratios, basically mature companies. Yeah. Um, Asset-based loans, the next line down, you, you know, same use of funds, but they're willing to take a little bit more risk than a bank. And we'll get into that more in a, in a, in a future slide, but um, you know, they have a little bit of a, a wider risk spectrum. Um, some of the other loans types on here are, are more for long-term. So let's say you're going out and you need money up front to hire uh, a new VP of sales or uh, a whole staff uh, or facilities or systems, you know, something that's more of a lump sum up front and the incremental cash flow is probably going to come over a longer period. Uh, that's probably gonna, you're going to want to look for a term loan, something that distributes the funds up front and allows you to pay it back over time. So it's really about matching the source of use. That's what bankers do. It, and and that's I think what what you know the the companies should do the entrepreneurs should do is is you know figure out the loan product that really matches up with the use of funds and the source of repayment. So I'd refer back to the the you know the field guide for more specifics on kind of the pros and cons, but this gives you a flavor of uh, you know how to kind of match up with with your cash needs. In the loan products, I, there's sponsored focus, bank term loan, and venture debt. It, it yeah. might be helpful um, if you kind of gave a little bit of a summary of like what does sponsored focus mean and sure. you know, what yeah and, and I I think in the blog post I mentioned that these two kind of behave similarly and and the underwriting of the deals is is somewhat similar the difference is that uh, well the similarity is that typically uh, you know a, a bank sponsored bank focused bank term loan and venture debt. They're really interested in who your sponsors are, obviously. They're, they're, so if you are uh, funded by VCs, you know, the big, the big name in, in that space on the bank side is Silicon Valley Bank. They have relationships with all of those different VC firms. And so, again, we get into it in a future slide, but they're underwriting the relationship with the VC as much as they're underwriting the company, and mainly because the 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 expected source of repayment is the next equity round. Usually the companies aren't quite profitable yet, so you can't rely on cash right. flow or the company by themselves to pay it back. So you're really underwriting to the likelihood of the next equity round. Where they differ is that venture debt is typically non-bank um, and it's in a subordinated position. So what that means is the bank has the first right to get cash flow and all access to the collateral of the company and a venture debt provider waits for the senior lender to get paid back before they get paid back. In a, in a, in a normal course, they might get paid concurrently through normal payments, mm -hmm. but in a worst case scenario where now you're, you're looking to get out of the deal and, and you know, if it goes down the unfortunate path of foreclosure or bankruptcy or liquidation of the company, the bank's going to get out first. So venture debt's yeah. a riskier instrument and, and, you know, tends to get priced accordingly. I think there's often confusion among founders of what uh, security means and, you know, the priority of yeah. security. And, and sometimes, you know, they, 
believe that they're taking an unsecured loan when they're in fact pledging all the assets of the company and the majority of the assets of the company. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes these products can be stacked together. Other times they're mutually exclusive. What would be some examples of products that you could use together and ones that would be mutually exclusive? Yeah, there, there are, you know, what's called a unit tranche facility where you'll get one kind of loan agreement and one security interest. And then the, the providers of that debt have sort of a waterfall behind the scenes of where of how they get paid out. Um, it, it ends up behaving pretty similar to if you just went out and got a bank loan and then turned around and went out and got a, a MES uh, loan or a venture debt loan. Um, but yeah, you, a lot of times, you know, a bank will be the first to the table and say, hey, this is great. We like the company, but it's a little bit too much. We have partners uh, who are willing to take a portion of it. So let's participate on a share. And then they kind of work through the, the mechanics of who gets paid first. But, but to, to your first, the first part of your uh, question, um, yeah, security interest is a legal item, right? And in most cases, uh, the lender, whether it's a senior lender or a venture debt lender, will be taking a legal interest in all of your company's assets in return for making a loan. I think where the confusion comes in is that for, for a lot of these like VC-backed loans, there isn't hard collateral to support it. So there's sort of an un, under collateralized and some people, sometimes people will call that unsecured, but that's more the like reality of, of is there collateral, hard collateral to support the loan or not versus the, the legal side of, is there a, a, a security interest or not? Okay, thanks. You make a really good point, I think, in the blog uh, about the difference between a lender pitch and the investor pitch, and I think which is really bears uh, some detail because I think entrepreneurs and founders often are always in, you know, investor pitch mode, <laughs> so yeah. they tend to default there. What, what do you think are the what's the key distinction here? Yeah, I'm smiling because you know I'm I'm a I'm a credit guy by trade, which I, I don't know if. My personality got me into it or, or the other way around, but, you know, I tend to be sort of uh, a downside focused. And that that really is the difference between an investor pitch and a lender pitch. Obviously, as a, as a lender, I want to know that you believe in your company and, and you expect it to do great things and that you have a, a sound strategy to get it there. But uh, my return is pretty limited as a lender. And so I have to be thinking about, well, what happens if this thing goes wrong? How do I get out? Or how does the company kind of remedy that situation? Um, so that, that's the main difference between an investor, an, an equity investor, and a, and a debt provider is that uh, equity investors are upside focused and, and lenders are downside focused. And everybody knows how, you know, the story on how VCs make most of their return on, you know, a very small subset of their portfolio. A couple companies go IPO and that makes up for a lot of the other investments that, you know, maybe don't provide much of a return or sometimes a, a negative return. Uh, with, with lenders, it's the exact opposite. You know, if everything goes right, you get your, you know, if you're a bank, 5% or, you know, if you're a MES debt, you know, 10, 15%, whatever. If it goes wrong, you can lose all of your, your principal. And so banks and lenders need to be uh, sure that every loan they make, it has a great chance of, of returning a positive return. So the, the chart off to the right is just sort of a visual. It's, it's meant to illustrate kind of the range of outcomes. So on the equity side, you know, you can have these huge upsides. Obviously, you can still have the, the downside, but if you looked at it kind of relative, you'd say, well, there's way more upside potential than there is downside risk. Whereas with the, on the lender's side, it's the exact opposite. You know, the upside is just that little sliver above a zero times return, uh, whereas the downside is, is, uh, is you know, all, all the principal. So how that, why, why that matters is that when you're pitching, uh, you know, a lender, again, you want to, you want to, give them all the upside and, and explain to them, you know, how the company is going to perform, but you also have to be really cognizant of how you manage the company and what 
you see as the risks as a manager and how you kind of mitigate those risks and how you would plan to manage through those. That's that's really what, what lenders are looking for. Right. So this, I thought, was a good example of like really bringing this to life. You know, I think it's... Um, it would be useful to step through this for founders, you know, to better understand kind of how, you yeah. know, where they might fit and how to reposition their pitch. Uh, not that they want to, you know, tell a totally different story, but, you know, yeah. to speak more of the lender's language. Yeah. And this isn't to say that, you know, in this example that you couldn't get debt if you were, you know, one of these two companies or you couldn't get equity if you were one or two of these. But I was just trying to illustrate, you know, that it's, Again, one is sort of upside potential and one is sort of downside protection. So if you if you walk through the examples, I wanted to make sure the companies, you know, kind of visually look the same. They're both in, you know, a similar space and, and have the same amount of sales per month. Uh, but company A uh, probably doesn't have the TAM, doesn't have the potential to be huge. Maybe it's a niche market. Um, they have really loyal customers, stable supply, stable profits. The owners like the company and they're they're you know planning to kind of stick it out. They don't have like these grand plans of of exiting for some huge return. Um, and you know, company B on the other side, huge opportunity, huge market. They're growing really quick, the market's growing really quick, but your margins are thin, your customers are pretty price sensitive, you know, not as loyal. Um, and you're in a growth mode. So as, as the owner of the company, you're, you're pushing money into sales and marketing. You're trying to grow the top line at the expense of uh, the bottom line. So the profitability isn't, isn't quite there. But because of that huge market opportunity, you, you think that there's a great you know, exit opportunity for you. Um, so, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm sort of loading the example, but it's, you know, if you looked at this as an investor, you'd say, okay, company B all day long. But if you're a, if you're a lender, you're thinking, I like the predictability of company A. I like, yeah. I like the, the stability, I like the pre predictability. It's probably not something that, you know, where execution risk is, is huge. Yeah. Um, so it's just, it's just an example that, you know, we, we're kind of looking for different things because our return uh, range is, is totally different. Yeah, I think it's a great point, and it and it's helpful for the founder to kind of rethink their language to to make sure that they're not giving the signals of high unpredictability. Or yeah, you probably, want, you probably want two decks, or or at least you want you know you probably have a lot of overlap in those two decks, and you probably want a couple of yeah. extra slides um, in the deck. I I think this this slide really resonated with me because. And the, your section of the blog post, I thought was so important. And you go through a ton of detail in this in the blog post. But I think people, they don't really understand the processes that they're getting into. Yeah. So it can feel like, oh man, this is taking forever. Or am I doing something wrong? Or do they not like me? And I just don't think they understand the stages. So it would yeah. be helpful, I think, to go through this. This. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. And, and I, you know, I've talked to folks who... You know, they're they're like, yeah, we got we got a debt deal lined up, and I'm like, oh great, you signed documents, and they're like, no, we got a term sheet. I'm like, okay, that's great. That that means something. Don't don't get me wrong, but it, it doesn't mean you're you're all the way through. Um, and the blog post goes into a lot of detail on you know sort of the uh, almost the psychological aspect of it. You know that there's this push and pull, and a typical lender is you know. At the same time, they're trying to make sure that they don't do a risky loan. They're also this, uh, there's a sales aspect, right? So they're trying to pull the customer along and keep them interested. They're trying to, you know, suss out the customer's intent. Hey, if I give them this term sheet, are they really going to want to go with me? Am I going to, you know, if I'm going to spend all this time and effort on the underwriting, do I stand a good chance of closing this deal? Um, so it's really this balance of, you know, asking for just enough info to to know, yeah, there's a deal here. Then a little bit more to say, yeah, I can get to a term sheet. Then a little bit more, and you know, and close the deal. And and I think that can just be, you know, with if you're if you're not a communicative lender, 
you know, I think that's one of the key points is hopefully you have a good lender who's explaining to you, you know, here's the process from day one. We're going to start here and we're going to go, you know, as long as things pro- progress from a risk standpoint, uh, we're going to we're going to go from this stage to that stage. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I think a lot of entrepreneurs get confused. They, they're like, but wait a second, why, you know, I already I already put my application in. Why, why are you now coming back with a whole raft of, you know, additional info requests. Well, who in each of these stages, if you were at a you know decent sized lender, who might you be interacting with at the various yeah. stages? Yeah, there's there's uh there's actually a, a stage before discovery. And I should the caveat I was gonna say is that this is, you know, my experience. Every lender does it a little bit different. And there are some lenders who are, you know, purposely trying to, to recreate the wheel. Uh, it's probably a, a blog post in a, in of itself. Um, but there is technically a stage before discovery, which is, you know, I, I would call it screening. And that's usually with either a business development rep or a sales officer at the lender. It's, it's usually the person who's going out and sourcing the deals. And there's really, really high level. What do you do? What are you looking for? Tell me what your top line number is. Tell me what your bottom line is. Really, really basic information to to uh, filter a deal and say, yeah, there's, you know, this isn't completely out of bounds. So let's let's move into discovery. What I what I focused on in the blog post because it's what I know is when the underwriter gets involved. Um, so that's that's you know uh, somewhere in the discovery phase. So you know the business development rep has got a loan application, got some high level info. It could be just through the app. Maybe there's you know a, a you know a summary financial statement, but it's really basic unvalidated info, and they pass that to the underwriter and say, hey, I think there's a deal here. So the underwriter gets involved in in discovery, and they're doing a little bit of a deeper dive to assess the loan eligibility. Yes, this meets what we would need to see in order to offer them this particular loan product, and in general, it just it matches you know, the, the downside bounds of our credit box. Mm. Um, so the, the lift is supposed to be pretty light in discovery. It's meant to, you know, you, you don't want to waste the borrower's time or the prospect's time if it's not a good fit. So the underwriter typically would say, okay, I've looked at, you know, summary financial information, um, gone through the website, asked a few questions. Yeah, there's no immediate reason why this we wouldn't be able to move forward with this deal. Mm-hmm. And then they take it into the initial analysis. Initial analysis, at least in my experience, that's where the bulk of the work is is performed. So that's where you're taking summary info and saying, okay, I got the year end financial statement from last year. You know, the the two page PDF. Now I need every you know, historical months data for the last two, three years, as much as you can provide. Because now they're really getting into the weeds of where is this company heading directionally? You know, it's a lot of trend analysis, sensitivity analysis, things like that. So initial analysis is is really uh, the heavy lift, at least in my experience. And you're trying to get enough information in to get to a, yeah, we would feel comfortable giving you this loan structure at this price. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's, you know, the goal of initial analysis is to get to a term sheet. And I make, you know, this point in the, in the uh, blog post that um, a term sheet's not binding. It's, it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's them saying, Hey, we've done enough research to, to say, we think we can get there. Um, If you're a good lender in my book, you should be able to execute on a term sheet 95% of the time. Mm. Um, but you will see people in the market who will issue a term sheet really, really early in the process. And you got to read the fine print in that term sheet because it will say at the bottom subject to, and sometimes it will just be a big word due diligence. And it's like, well, mm. okay, they haven't asked for much info or I just gave it to them and they turned around and gave me a term sheet the next day. You know, there's there's some healthy skepticism that probably needs to you know, be taken on on the entrepreneur's part as to how we're in the process to get the term sheet. Um, but like in, in my experience, I don't like issuing a term sheet until I know you know ninety 
with 95% confidence that I'm going to be able to close that deal. So what that means for me is that the, the, the due diligence stage, the last stage is really about validation. So you can think of that as like, you know, maybe I need to have a third party uh, auditor or appraiser go in and look at the sites and, and you know, look, evaluate the, the inventory, for example. Um, I've already done my analysis. I've, I've looked at the numbers. They all seem to foot, seems to be legit. Maybe I've taken a site visit in, in the old days, you know, uh, bankers would go out and, you know, walk through the warehouse. Um, but you still need uh, some some independent kind of validation, just like just like a real estate, you know, a, a mortgage uh, provider would require a third party appraisal. So right. that's that's hopefully what happens in the due diligence phase, as well as maybe a few kind of clarifying items from. Uh, you know, that, that fell out of the initial analysis. Yeah. Um, so that's why I said it's, that this is where it gets probably the most murky is in that term sheet, you should see it if it's far enough along, it should say uh, subject to formal credit approval mm -hmm. and maybe like two or three specifics, completion of an appraisal, validation of, you know, ownership percentage, you know, very specific, um, and hopefully uh, very few bullet points of what has to happen next. If you see the big vague bullet points or tons of bullet points, it gives you a clue that there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah. Is that something that you would uh, a founder would negotiate or would they just sort of take that with a grain of salt and say, well, maybe I'll try to get a term sheet that from somebody Yeah, else I think it's the latter. Um, I mean, you, you could, you know, I, yeah, if I were in the entrepreneur's shoes and you got a term sheet, let's say you, you're going out to three lenders, three competitors yeah. looking for the same product. The, all of those lenders are trying to get you a term sheet as soon as possible, right? Because they, they know the first one to get the term sheet is going to get the most attention. Yeah. And that can cause some weird incentives where now maybe some, one of the lenders say, well, you know, screw it. Give them the term sheet and put in subject to the world. And hopefully they commit to us and then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out later. Um, not the best approach in my mind, but if you're an entrepreneur and you get that first term sheet and it has all that vague language in it, maybe you want to wait for another one and then kind of compare and contrast. And then at that point, be very clear with both. Hey, what's the lift here? I've got one over here that looks like I only need to do three things. And, and yours is this big amorphous, you know, TBD. Right. Um, so, yeah, you know, as a lender, I want, uh, especially on the sales side of the house, you want to know that there's intent to close. So that's a lot of times where, you know, the term sheet will say, hey, if you, if you want to move forward, sign here and cut us a small check so we can go pay for that appraiser, uh, mm -hmm. approval, for example. Um, so that's where it gets a little bit tricky. You, you know, don't necessarily want to sign multiple term sheets and cut multiple checks. But again, it's not a contract. It's not binding. Um, so that that is the negotiation part of it is, you know, hey, I'm interested, but I need to know a little bit more of what's what's remaining in the process. So probably won't spend a ton of time on this slide. It's this is this is a summary of of uh, what's in the blog post in a lot more detail. Uh, but I thought it was, you know, just to give an idea of, hey, at each one of these stages, what are we talking about? Um, you know, I said that the discovery phase is a light lift and then you look at this and you're like, well, there's still a lot there. I think the intent here is that uh, the, the hope is um, from the lender's perspective that this summary info, it, as an owner of the com company, you hopefully already have a lot of this stuff at your fingertips uh, because you're, you're using it to run your business. And so that's, that's, you know, that's sort of the common sense approach is, in the discovery phase, it's hopefully stuff you already have. Right. And with that, they can get a sense of, you know, the, the big picture kind of direction of the company. Um, initial analysis gets into the weeds. Um, yeah. And in, a, in, a, in the blog post and in a future slide here, we talk about, you know, how this could get even more in the weeds, depending on the type of product you're looking for. Uh, but in general, this is where you're you're going in, you know, taking an, an annual statement and breaking it down to, you know, monthly and looking at all the line items and, and using that to kind of build your uh, your any kind of forecast or sensitivity analysis. 
you know, the, the discovery phase info requests, uh, to me, look like um, if you don't have that, you know, you, you probably are running your business poorly uh, and you should get that together, right? Yeah. Um, even the initial analysis, though, uh, you know, I could see, you know, maybe earlier stage, you don't have the depth of accounting and bookkeeping to, to you know, have some of these reports, but yeah. they, they shouldn't be huge lifts. I, I agree. And, and uh, it's a great point. And that's, it's, it's almost, uh, I don't want to say it's a test, but from a credit guy's perspective, it is kind of a test, right? Sure. Um, if, if we ask for this info and they're like, okay, give us a month to put it together. You're exactly right. The, 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 the impression that leaves with the lender is, okay, these guys don't have this. Why don't they have this? So it, right. it to create questions. Um, and, and yeah, on the, on the, on the detail side, um, you know, kind of the same, kind of the same take. And one of the things, yeah, I mentioned earlier, you know, people, uh, lenders are trying to, um, constantly reinvent that kind of three-stage process. Um, there's no harm in asking a lender for what, what's all of the info you're going to need in an initial analysis when you're in the discovery phase and either starting to, or if you're really on top of your stuff, give it all at once. I mean, as a credit guy, I love that because now we right. can actually go all the way through all at once. And in fact, you know, that when we, in, in another blog post, we'll talk about, you know, kind of the fintech side of things that that's, that's really what fintechs are trying to do is they're, they're, they're going one step further and saying, okay, I don't even want the finished product. Just give me access to your raw data and I'm going to plug it into mine and spit out the, the, the finished into my own models. And so they're trying to do, and that's why they'll say, Hey, I can get you a term sheet super fast. If you just give me access to hundred percent of your info, you know, and there's, there's pros and cons there, but that that's really what's going on is, is they want all the data up front and then they can use that and, and, and automate some of this and hopefully get to a term sheet much quicker. Um, yeah. So if you're on top of your stuff and you, and, and you're dealing with, you know, a reputable lender, yeah, there's no harm in, in providing them with the, the full stack of info uh, earlier in the process, it, it should accelerate things. Okay, so I thought this was interesting too because you know there's all this variety of products, um, but some are unique and and will create their own requests. Yeah. It might be helpful just to go through some of the high level. Yeah, you know, and again, there's, there's more detail in the blog post, but you know, the first part here is it's it's really a repeat of what we said on the on the uh, first couple slides, right, is that it's understanding, you know, from the lender's perspective, they want to understand what their expected repayment source is, right? So if it's inventory, it's the sale of that inventory in a three-month window, or if it's, you know, a, a new kind of sales engine, it's it's probably a longer-term incremental cash flow payback. Um, but but it's the same, right? They're, they're looking for... Uh, the repayment source and the time horizon to then kind of align it with their product. And then ultimately, as, as we've said, you know, it depends on your life cycle. They're, they're putting this into their credit box. So, you know, maybe they're fine if you're not profitable because they're, you know, the, they're underwriting to that and they're probably charging uh, a premium because of that. Um, so what we focus in on this slide and in the blog post are uh, three specific loans that are, what I would call kind of specialized loans. Um, and it might help to just compare back to bank products again. Banks always look for two ways out of a deal, a primary repayment source and a secondary. They'll also sometimes have a tertiary, which is, is you know, your primary may be working capital, uh, secondary might be your cash flow from operations, tertiary might be guarantor support. So they're looking for companies that are really stable and solid across all uh, metrics and that and i call that sort of a generalized underwriting process they're looking at everything and it all has to hit a pretty high bar as a result they don't have to get in the weeds too far on any one topic uh, these these providers abl venture debt mezzanine debt 
they are more reliant on a single source, a primary source of repayment. And therefore, they do a lot of diligence because, you know, the, the alternative is if that primary dries up, maybe there isn't a strong secondary. Uh, so with ABL is the easiest example because it's, um, you know, it's I'm, I'm lending you money to go buy inventory because I know what that inventory is worth and I've seen you sell it and I know how much you sell it for and I should be able to get paid back in, you know, three months. So they go to, you know, bedrock when it gets to, you know, understanding the inventory. So everything they're, you know, they're going to be, they're going to want every single piece of info that has to do with your supply chain, with your, your inventory monitoring systems, your sell through, you know, everything. Uh, and so, and, and, and really, I mean, if it helps to think of it this way, an ABL lender, uh, also knows how to sell inventory. They have a team or, or they have partnerships with liquidators. And so they underwrite to the point where it's, I almost don't, I don't really need the borrower there. If things go that far off the rails, I know I can go in and sell this at X percent, you know, via some, you know, selling it to TJ Maxx or, or some other liquidation channel. Um, so that's how in the weeds they get. Um, the other, the other reality with ABL, which is interesting is it's a, uh, highly monitored, uh, after the money goes out. So what that means is, you know, if you make, if, if, if they expect someone's going to pay them back in 90 days and 91 days rolls by and it hasn't paid back, the structure is built in a way that it's going to kind of tighten and contract to limit their exposure. Uh, so they're getting weekly reporting. They're they're you know getting lock boxes oftentimes where the money is going straight to them, and then they'll cut you a check back after the, after they pay themselves back. Uh, there's quarterly appraisals. Um, all these things is, is to stay really really real time on top of that inventory. Um, and the, the so the structure is really um, adjustable, constantly adjustable based off of the, the, the reality of the day. Uh, term loans, not so much. All the money's out the door. Now they have to wait for it to get paid back. And as long as you're paying, you know, that's, they're, they're likely just kind of waiting on the sidelines. Um, so it's a, it's a different animal. They, uh, they really under, need to understand kind of the ultimate uh, repayment source. So with, with venture debt, we talked about it a little bit before. Uh, you're underwriting uh, to the VCs and to their continued support of the company. You're asking them, hey, what are your funding milestones? What's, what are the KPIs that you're tracking management to? Uh, and what happens if they start to get off of those KPIs? What's your response? Uh, you'll go even further to, you know, interviewing the partners at the VC fund and understanding how much dry powder they have set aside in their fund to support that company. So it's very much about willingness to support, ability to support, timing to support, level of support, contingencies to support. That was what I spent a lot of my time at BridgeBank, you know, because that, that was a focus of theirs was, was early and late stage VC lending. So it was all about continued investor support. So different animal. Um, and, and, and so they're going to dig in a lot on that sponsorship side. Uh, mezzanine debt, lastly, is sort of in between, but it's, uh, you know, they, they'll, they'll do deals if there's a sponsor, but they'll do it if there isn't a sponsor. Uh, in that case, it's all about cash flow sufficiency. So it's, it's bottom line, you know, how is this company cash flowing and what are the threats to that cash flow? So I think in that case, it's a lot about, execution risk and sort of market risk. So really mm -hmm. kind of understanding your niche in the market and, and your economic moat, what, what, you know, what's going to keep you, uh, cash flowing, um, you know, understanding kind of your vendor relationships, making sure that there are no hiccups from a supply chain standpoint, really just making yeah. sure that you continue to run efficiently and, and you're scalable and you know, that you're, you're, you're managing that cash flow. Um, so, Three different products, three different primary sources of repayment. So you can imagine three different 
focuses when it comes to the type of info and the level of detail that they're going to get into. I think this is interesting. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's a thousand different ways, but what are some of the top ways, you know, that the processes get off track? Yeah, I think, unfortunately, if it, let's, let's assume it's a good lender, right? So I, I spent a lot of time talking in the blog post about if you're, if you're a lender who doesn't really know the space, uh, you know, you're trying to be a generalist, you're trying to, or you're, you're maybe worse than that. You're trying to take a company with a short term cash flow need and push it into a long term, you know, cash flow product. You know, there's, there's likelihood that they're going to start, you know, spinning around the axles, right? Get wrapped around the axle. Um, but I was going to say, unfortunately, in my experience, what tends to cause it is a surprise. Um, and, you know, sometimes that's a function of, hey, we didn't ask for this info because we wanted to, you know, keep the lift light, but we need it now. And then you dig into that and you're like, oh, there's, there's a problem. Um, typically, if that happens, that happens, should happen in the initial analysis. So you're not too far into the process to where it's like, well, you know, crap, I wasted all that time. Um, the worst case scenario is that you get a term sheet issue, the lender, you know, that 5% confidence, you know, that I mentioned earlier. And usually what that's caused by is, is something in the validation doesn't come back the way it was supposed to. So the easy example would be that the appraiser goes in and says, hey, you know, the, the, the uh, inventory wasn't there or, you know, it was in disarray or it doesn't, doesn't you know, the, the inventory system is not tracking the inventory. Or maybe there is, you know, some sort of licensing agreement that, that wasn't, wasn't clear up front. And now it's, okay, who really has rights to this? Uh, inventory and is there a concern that the you know the supply might get cut off? Um, so I talk about it in a in a in a future slide, but you know, it's it's there's two types of surprises. There's that surprise where it's sort of you know the borrower is well intentioned and it it just you know it didn't it didn't show up until you got some sort of third party validation. The other is that there's something going on at the borrower level that should have been disclosed, like, you know, a, law, a pending lawsuit, or like I said, a licensing agreement that expires next week and, or, you know, some supply agreement that, you know, uh, is, is likely to get materially renegotiated or you're losing your biggest supplier. You know, things like that, those are surprises that can derail a deal. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, again, I'm being a little bit self-serving, but a good chunk of those, it's it's because we we weren't aware of it because we weren't informed of it. Right. So a, a lot of this actually sounds like it's in the control of the the founder, or the entrepreneur, or the borrower. You know, are, are they going with a lender that specializes in their their type of product and their type of yeah. business? And secondly, you know, if there are things in their business that could potentially be surprises, they would be better off disclosing them early in the process as opposed to hoping it doesn't come up. Yeah. I mean, obviously you can't control for everything, but you know, if you knew that in your example, that there was a pending lawsuit or that your, your number one supplier was about to leave you, you know, you, you'd be yeah. better off addressing that in a, your backup plan. Okay. Yeah. There's, yeah. There's certain things that are out of everybody's control. I mean, we all went through it March of 2020, right? COVID right. hit. And you're in, in the midst of closing deals and you're like, well, I'm not sure if this company's, you know, I, I was dealing with SaaS companies. So a lot of them were actually benefit, <laughs> benefited from it um, in a in sort of a, a little bit of a weird way. But uh, but yeah, you know, if you have if you have some sort of external shock like that, then obviously that's that's a different ballgame. But I, I agree with your assessment. Yeah, a lot of it is. Does the lender know what they're doing to begin with? Um, and are you, are you self-disclosing? Which leads right into this next slide of like, yeah. you know, what, what are, how do you stand out? So, you know, if we try to tie together some of this stuff, you know, there's nothing in here that's really like, you know, an 
an epiphany, right? I mean, it's all sort of common sense, but uh, the, the, the underwriter is trying to get a sense of how well do you know your, your, your company and, and, you know, their numbers guys, right? So numbers people. So it's, it's you know, assessing how well you know your numbers. Um, and we, we just talked about, you know, being transparent. Um, and the last piece is around the kind of the what if, right? So th that downside planning. So if you do have that, that entrepreneur who is, you know, great at rallying the troops and great with, you know, from a vision standpoint, you know, sometimes you'll have this situation where it's like, what plan B? There is no plan B. This thing's mm -hmm. you know, up and to the right. This thing's going to the moon. Yeah. Okay. But again, thinking up, you know, from a lender's perspective, it's, if it hits the moon, lender only makes 5%, 10%. Right. So you have to have that sort of, you know, downside uh, story ready and, you know, having that in the form of, you know, really concrete backup plans is a, is a great way to improve. Yeah, what, what do you mean by, you know, I, I read backup plans and it's, it, I feel like you're asking for, you know, a 12 page document that outlines plan B, C, D, and E. I'd say like, is that what you mean? No, no, I, yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's more, I, I mean, here's how I would tie it together is uh, if you ask a company, like, what are your KPIs? Um, and then you ask them, what are your risks? And they give you a risk that doesn't tie back to the other KPIs. Then you're thinking, okay, maybe they don't know their numbers or maybe, you know, their risks are not aligned. Um, and then you get to the backup plan and it's like, okay, what influences that KPI? So if you're, if you're really on top of things, those three flow together really nicely where it's my KPI is, you know, I'm tracking customer churn or, you know, renewal rates on my subscription um, because, you know, I feel like our biggest risk is that, you know, our product set is due for a refresh and there's some new competitors and where we might start to see trouble is, you know, we'll start to see that, that you know, renewal rate dip. Um, and here's my plan. You know, and, and it's both a forward looking plan. That's why I need your money is because I'm going to go invest in some product improvements. But, you know, maybe it's also client success or, you know, some other some other metric that you're doing. So there, there's that sort of stuff where it's just it's a it's a it's a through, you know, the storyline is consistent through one, two and three. But to answer your question explicitly on on the downside protection kind of plan B, it, it really is about, you know, how do I, uh, how do I uh, reduce costs if I need to? Again, I'm a little bit, you know, my recent history has been dealing with companies that are not yet cash flow positive. So I'm a little bit, you know, maybe, maybe uh, hyper-focused on that. But, you know, I'll spend a lot of time looking at well, what could they do to get to cash flow break even? And so it's really about, well, I can, I can, you know, cut here or I can, you know, maybe whatever uh, sort of marketing events I had planned, you know, I could maybe cut some of those back. And here's how I think it will impact future sales. But I think we can, we can get by because we have really good repeat customers, really loyal customers, really good retention rates. So, you know, marketing, cutting that is more about cutting off future growth, but shouldn't impact our, our revenues too much. And by cutting that marketing spend, I can instantly drive, you know, X improvement to the bottom line. So if I start to see, you know, something slipping from, from you know, margin perspective, I know I can cut there. So it, it, that's like a simple example, of like a concrete action. The harder part that I've found is when, when do you do that? Right. The people have the plan B and it's a solid plan B, but then when you get to that point where the, you know, the, the underwriter or, or, you know, I'm thinking now more post funding, the lender is asking, Hey, you know, it looks like you're off on this KPI. How's that marketing you know, budget cut coming? They're like, I'm doubling down on marketing because I, I think, you know, it's a, I'm going to be able to get through it because of X, Y, and Z. Um, those are always, you know, tough conversations to have. And, and, you know, sometimes it's a really solid plan, but yeah, I think 
it, it's a tough question to answer, but I, I think it's an important part is thinking about when do I make these, you know, calls. And I think mm -hmm. sometimes just having it sort of black and white, I'm going to do this if we get to that point and kind of stick right. with it, um, you know, can be helpful. Uh, but this gets into the next slide, but it's, you know, looking at how folks execute through missed plans, um, you know, it, it tells you a lot about, about the management of, of a company. Um, and I, I think I say in the blog post that, you know, I've, I've had borrowers that missed plan and did all the right things and kind of got through it and were super transparent all the way through that process. Those are the ones that I'm way more likely to continue to support and potentially even give more money to, you know, it's sort of a quid pro quo, and, you know, I'll, right. I'll, I'll do my part, you're doing your part. Um, so it's, it's hugely valuable to, you know, to set up those plans and then know when and how to execute to them. Easier said than well, done. Yeah, so I think that that was a great segue, and uh, you know, so one way to stay in the good graces is good communication and having your um, doing what you say you're going to do. Right. There are some other things. Yeah, I think uh, just um, the well, I, I think first um, I, I I frame this kind of negatively, and then I try to frame it positively down in the keep in mind section. So I'll start with that. Um, it's, it's really important, you know, it, from a lender's perspective, all this stuff that you're supposed to do after the loan is really important. Now, if you go back to our ABL example, that's an easy one because the lender has the control to say, well, you, you, you need to give me a weekly borrowing base and you didn't. So you're not, I'm not advancing until you do. So there's a lot of control that the lender has, but imagine you're in a, in a, on a term loan that's, you know, not supposed to be paid back for three years. You know, once the money's out the door, you, you'll have certain borrowers will say, yeah, leave me alone. Um, you know, I got what I wanted and I'm paying you back per the plan. So what else do you care about? And it, it's just important to note, it's not a mortgage. It's not, you know, especially if it's a cash flow loan or it's, it's a loan where, like we said, they're under collateralized. Um, you know, a, a lender needs to understand kind of the, the big picture of what's going on with the company to anticipate any, any future hiccups. And that's what covenants are for. That's what reporting requirements are for. And so there are teeth in the loan docs around, hey, if you don't ad adhere to these, you know, it's technically a default and, and, a, and a lender can do a lot of, a lot of things from, you know, tough to really tough. So that's yeah. the kind of negative side of it. That's kind of the stick side of it. But the carrot side of it is, you know, if you're on top of your reporting and you're communicating well with the borrower or with the lender, um, you're, they're way more likely to work with you through an inevitable hiccup. Um, and more importantly, or, or more optimistically, when you need more money because you're kicking butt, they're, you know, they're way more likely to, to do it with, with a much lighter lift because now, you know, they have all the historical data, the underwriting process for a, for an increase or a rate reduction is, is a heck of a lot simpler and smoother. So th those yeah. are the reasons why to stay in the good graces, but back to your, your question, you know, it's the same thing, staying on top of your numbers, um, you know, and, and communicating results. And you show that through, you know, being consistent and timely in how you report um, and, and being communicated, communicative and, and proactive in sharing the news that might not come across in the financial reporting. I think one thing that, I mean, we've all heard, uh, stories um i certainly have you know of of borrows tripping covenants and having really bad outcomes you know yeah. cash sweeps basically being put out of business or really difficult circumstances and i think you know one thing that i don't think borrowers or founders are cognizant of is how important these covenants are and that you know what you uh, a chain of events happens, right? Like you trip a covenant um, or, 
you know, go into some sort of technical default. And all of a sudden, you are now really at the mercy of, of the lender. It's yeah. up to them to decide how aggressive and severe they want to be in the enforcement of those things. Right. So, like, that's just a bad position to be in the, in the first place, right? You don't want to ever be, like, you know, at the mercy of somebody else's kindness or, no. or, or uh, you know, forbearance. Right. And then I think the other thing that is often lost, and you made this point just a minute ago, is like these aren't mortgages, right? Where it's very anonymous and you know, uh, it just gets the money gets taken out of your checking account and whatever. Right. You know, these are people at the other end and people are gonna make judgments. And if you don't do the effort to build that relationship, it's it's way easier for the person at the other side of that to make a judgment against you that's not in your interest. Right. Um, and I, yeah, exactly. so I, 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 uh, it, it was sort of like, um, a, uh, a little hidden reality that, you know, I would, wouldn't always get brought in on a, you know, a tough call with a borrower, you know, that was in default. Uh, but on the ones that I w would, there were two outcomes. There was, you know, the one where they, you know, it wasn't a good com uh, conversation either because they they weren't communicative or they didn't have a plan or you know they were trying to shift it off on you know just leave us alone and the other half was you know they had a great plan and they were super proactive and everything was logical of what they were trying to do and you could tell that they were you know trying to work through it um, and the, the hidden kind of secret was that I, I, I would go to bat for those companies, the latter category, right? right? Because, you know, it, we are just people and, you know, shit happens. So, yeah. Well, and you don't want, nobody wants to go into a default. I mean, no, no, and, and, yeah. And, so, I, mean, want... I think yeah. the, the broader point, and this would be a, probably a, you know, a, a blog post of its own would be around, you know, that that's, that's where kind of the reputation of the lender comes into play because, there are certain lenders that are, I don't want to say predatory, but, but there, there is an expectation in, in a certain level. It's like the lender of last resort. And yeah. that, that can be a good thing by itself. So again, I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, denigrate it. As long as both sides kind of know what's going on, right? Which is, hey, I need this and I understand if this doesn't work out, you're going to take some pretty strong actions. My point though is that yeah, there are some lenders in the, in particularly in those situations where it's like, if you break a covenant, you, this is where it's going, right? We're going, yeah. to take, we're going to take pretty active control and that could be, yeah. that could include foreclosing. Um, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're a bank loan or if you're, a, you know, kind of relationship focused, uh, lender, you're, you're probably not set up to do that. Plus you're worried about your reputation you know, in the marketplace. And so you're much, you're way away would rather, you know, you'd, you'd much prefer to have the borrower work their way out of it than have to take the reins yourself. You know, I'm not right. at running a company or, or liquidating a company. So way better to kind of cooperate. And so for those lenders, um, you know, covenants are, are, important, super important, and they do allow that backs up to a lender. But first and foremost, they're an opportunity to get back to the table and discuss what's going on and, and kind of work through it. Um, well, I think, I think those are great points. And that the one that I would add to that is in that when we have customers, sometimes when they discuss covenants, it's, un, you know, they maybe haven't spent the time thinking through those covenants and the implications of breaking them. You know, yeah. and then they also, I don't think, have a full understanding of how to fulfill those covenants. And I, that I think is another area where it's worthwhile before you sign uh, to really like, how do I fulfill this? What are you expecting? You know, yeah. let's go through some examples so that you don't get into a situation where in month one, they're like, oh, you've already broken a covenant. And yeah. now you're like, you know, a strike down and you haven't even gotten going. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And, and it gets to, back to a lot of things we were saying up front about like how how well do you know your numbers so you have to know your numbers really well in order to you know assess whether or not you're going to be able to adhere to a financial covenant and yeah you know 
sometimes they're set pretty simply, but most times the lender has forecasted out what they expect to happen. Then they do their sensitivity analysis and say, I can still get out even if they're off plan by X amount. So I'm going to set the financial covenant right to that point. So now I'm back at the table, but I also kind of know it's not too late that the company could kind of, if they stabilize from that point forward, you know, I'm still going to get out of the deal. Okay. So yeah, it, it, it behooves you as the entrepreneur to understand what they're looking at as, you know, to, to drive that, that model, that forecasting. And if you've already done your own forecasting and your own sensitivity analysis, not only are you going to be much better at, at, coming up with your own plan B's and C's. Uh, you're going to be better at negotiating the covenants with the lender. And in, like I said earlier, you're probably going to impress them to the point where they either don't need the covenant because they believe in you or they kind of defer to you on where to set it. Um, yeah. So it's, it's just a lot of positive feedback that happens if you're on top of your numbers and, and take the time to do your own, you know, kind of modeling and forecasting. Mm. I mean, not, you know, again, it's, it's tricky for a, a really small company, obviously, but, um, you know, Bainbridge is a good source for, you know, a way to kind of drive people in that direction. Yeah. Not we, the we, we have to have somebody who can help. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, this has been great. Um, and that leads us, you know, I think into the end, which is, um, you know, and I'll uh, do a little bit of plugging here for Bainbridge, but a lot of what you described is stuff that we can help you know, customers with and stuff that we've already helped with, particularly around getting the numbers together, the projections, the what if scenarios, the financial packages. Um, and then, you know, I think another great thing about what Bainbridge does is that we're lined up with people like you, you know, that can provide the real other side of it, you know, and the, and the in-depth knowledge and feedback to make sure that people are, um, thinking about the processes correctly and, and maximizing their chances of success. Yeah. Yeah. Having, having, I mean, even if it's a summary access to, you know, the information that you guys are able to provide, uh, not only would it speed up the process, but it, it would be of huge value to somebody on my side of the table, just, you know, to be able to see that, that different kind of scenario planning and know that, you know, real time it can be, can be adjusted and adapted to, you know, what's going on in the world. Nice. Mike, thank you. Look forward to talking again soon. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, absolutely. Take care.